All right, we're talking about AI this half hour. And while there are concerns that it's moving too fast, the medical field is touting some advancements. A study from UCSF found AI is as good as a physician at prioritizing which patients need to be seen first. Researchers say using AI during triage can help free up critical time for a doctor to treat patients. It looks at their clinical notes to determine symptoms and severity. And new artificial intelligence could also help in cancer therapy. Researchers in Australia developed a new tool that predicts a patient's messenger RNA profile and determines what treatment could be most effective. It was trained on more than 5,500 patients across 16 cancer types, including breast, lung, and pancreatic cancers. And AI accelerating the discovery of new antibiotics. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania used an AI program to analyze tens of thousands of bacteria and produce dozens of promising antibiotic compounds. The authors say what once took years will now just take a few hours and will be especially helpful in fighting drug-resistant infections. Joining me now is UC Berkeley business professor, Dr. Olaf Grote. Thank you so much for joining us. Always fun to be with you, Liz. Thanks always, for having me. Always so fascinating to talk to you. You've been studying AI. You teach it in your classrooms. That's right. This is such an exciting time for the advancement of artificial intelligence. But, you know, it has impact on lots of different industries, some in a good way, some in a not so good way. We just talked about the advancements in medicine, which are very promising, but I'm curious, you know, what's the kind of the long game with that? Could AI potentially make healthcare less expensive? Is it gonna change the way students learn in medical school? What do you think? Yeah, look, I think in medicine, AI can't come early enough, right? We mm -hmm. just heard the uh, ability of AI to aggregate tons of different streams of data much better, much quicker than a human brain can. That is uh, really high value. Uh, but uh, the cost efficiency there, that's a real long game, a long, long game, because for every doctor whose life you're making more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you are actually hiring data scientists. You hire AI uh, scientists. Uh, and, and you're going to have to get into expensive contracts with companies, whether consulting or, or large tech companies, that will put these models in place for you. And to amortize that and bring it down to uh, cost reductions will take a number of years. Yeah. It's interesting to see where that's going to grow. But also, you know, earlier we talked about the AI technology and the demands it's made on the power grid. And, you know, nowadays, a company, it's not just to perk to go green or to be environmentally friendly. It's a requirement. Mm -hmm. So how do they balance, you know, advancing AI technology and doing everything they can to develop the latest and greatest, but also not making a huge impact on the environment? Well, yeah, first of all, we're looking at, a, at, a, at an incredible impact of AI and EVs, which are also in part AI driven in, uh, in uh, power consumption. We're looking at an increase of about two uh, uh, peta kilo, uh, peta watt per hour, um, two petawatts, and that's about a trillion kilowatts each. Wow. So that's a massive amount that yeah. we have to actually field. So that's about 200 gigawatt uh, delivery uh, of supply every year. That's 200 nuclear power plants uh, in OECD amazing. countries. So that's, that's amazing. We're balancing that by using AI for energy efficiency, scheduling uh, energy supply and uh, off-peak times, uh, scheduling different computing tasks at different times of the day, uh, and balancing the grid because there'll be a lot of pressure on the grid once all of that comes into full swing. Right. All right, we've got to talk about government regulations. It's interesting to see the U.S. strategy on this because, you know, you look at the EU, they have their own set of laws. You look at China, they have their set of laws that uh, are going towards a different perspective than maybe the U.S. is. But do you see the U.S. eventually going towards a more centralized, you know, bill of rights, much like the Biden administration is suggesting is that we have a cer certain set of laws that all the companies follow and that's what you follow? Or do you think that it's going to continue to kind of piecemeal these laws together? It'll take a little while longer mm -hmm. uh, because we traditionally have the culture of letting a thousand flowers bloom. That's our innovation strength. We're competing against China. We need California and the tech companies to continue to be the engines of economic growth in America. So people are not really eager to regulate uh, large tech on AI. However, it will happen. 
happen only because these tech companies, whether they're domestic or international, uh, can't really scale uh, solutions throughout the United States if we have 20, 30 different state laws that govern AI. So eventually mm -hmm. we'll get there. I think we're currently seeing a bit of an up uplift there. Congress uh, has introduced a bipartisan uh, bill, uh, the American Privacy Rights Act, APRA, that with a little bit of luck, we'll speak to the 81% of Americans who are uh, n not happy with how large tech is actually taking their data and using AI to objectify them, as it were, which is the flip side of all the valuable services we get from the tech companies. Yeah, no question, a hot topic right now. All right, exactly. Dr. Olaf Groth, thank you. We're going to see you in the next block. Sounds good. Still ahead, it sounded like Scarlett Johansson, but she says, that's just not me. How AI could be copying celebrities. going to be addressed first in a way. I mean, is it going to be like this industry or like out just in the normal world, people are going to start losing jobs, like not in the movie industry at all. Like right. you know, so many people are going to lose their jobs just to an AI that can, you know, do so much. Obviously, we're all waiting and supporting like this, like the passing of legislation to protect everybody's individual rights. Actress Scarlett Johansson is just one of the latest celebrities to blast open AI. She says her voice was copied without her consent for the company's personal assistance program. The CEO of OpenAI says out of respect for Ms. Johansson, they have paused using the voice in their products. This is OpenAI's business model. They troll the entire internet for every image. They vacuum it up and make many, many, many millions of dollars off of this. Who isn't getting paid? The artists. Joining me once again is UC Berkeley business professor, Dr. Olaf Groth. Thanks so much for sticking with us for one more block. Of course. So AI, huge impact on the entertainment business. Movie executives really like it because it could potentially save them a lot of money. But the people who are actually making the movie, like the actors, the writers, the directors, this is a huge problem. Yeah, it's an absolute problem. Replicating somebody's likeness, as it were, without getting their permission first, uh, much less paying them, is a no-go. You can't really do that. It's it's a violation of fairness and ethics, I think professional ethics. And so that will be eventually regulated. And we are starting to see the development of technology tools that will help with that. And then there is the whole other issue that the Actors and, and Screenwriters Guilds addressed successfully, in my estimate, uh, and I think for all of our benefit, because they were the first to say, look, this is my creative work. And if AI now looks at that, replicates that, and can replicate me, I need to be cut into that proposition with my for my creative creativity, and you have to work with me on this. And luckily, um, uh, the studios agreed, and there was agreement reached, uh, that um, uh, if AI is at play, it has to partner with the screenwriter, and the screenwriter will get credit and will get paid. Uh, intellectual property law helped there mm -hmm. because you can't really assign intellectual property to an AI without a legal persona behind it. You know, the big concern also with AI is how it's going to impact the job industry. Is it going to cause people to lose their jobs? Is it going to create jobs that some people aren't prepared to do? How do you think it's going to impact the job industry? It's going to change how uh, jobs are composed, how different tasks are managed. It's going to change the life of the university professor and the TV anchor. Yep. Um, uh, there are just certain things that an AI can do better, uh, even when it comes to pretending to be us. And depending on what tasks that's for, we may well like that. But it's all in the design. It's gotta be a thoughtful job design. Mm -hmm. What does AI do, do better, and do with our agreement, versus what do we do? And how do we make sure that we got that split right? Um, so I would encourage anybody amongst your viewers who is taking a new job, think about how that job will be evolving over the next five years, engage with your management, with HR, right. to think about what's that new trade-off between AI and the human. 
And I'm curious that, that as an employee, do you have to just know that whatever job you're taking, chances are you're going to have to keep retraining, taking new classes, and adapting with changing technology no matter what you do? Absolutely. We're going through that right now with an AI task force at Berkeley Haas, where all the professors and the staff now have to think about how do we collaborate with AI? What's legitimate? What's out of bounds? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you advise students? How do you work with professors to make sure the content is respected and their craft is respected? But change is coming for all of us. There's no way around it. All right, all right Dr. Olaf Grove, thank you so much for being here. Fascinating conversation. And we'll be right back.